Sergey and uh, welcome everyone. Good afternoon. The title of this seminar is Dairy Industry Challenges, Strategic and Realistic Research Directions. I will not waste time going through self-introduction again because Sergey has done that for me. But what I want to do this afternoon is to first of all give you an overview of the dairy industry. And just like any other industry in the business, there are challenges and I'll move on to give you some thoughts that I have about strategic research that we need to be doing or what we're currently doing and I'll try to summarize and uh, conclude. So let's look at the dairy industry. For me, just the look of the green pastures, the black and white of Holston Parisian gives you a great picture of happy cows, real green grass, and they're able to convert that grass into milk, something that we as humans can do. So you might as well say, well, dairy cattle are actually able to recycle some of these materials that we can't utilize at all. I'll give you a bit of a breakdown of the industry. Now, as far as we know, after wheat and beef, the dairy industry is the third largest rural industry in Australia. And it brings in about 3.9 billion if you're looking at the farm gate value. And I should also point out that it is a major export industry that's worth about 2.75 billion. Now, in most of the states, some of the milk is consumed, but we do know that 45% of the milk that's produced is actually exported. As at last year, the total number of dairy cows in Australia was 1.6 million. And these 1.6 million cows were sort of producing about 9.1 billion in total in terms of litres of milk. Now, when you look at the average herd size of about 230, it means that each cow on the average was producing about 5,700 litres. It will probably bring the picture a bit clearer if you then look at the state distribution. Um, so nationally, what you see is that this month of July is usually where the milk production is the lowest, at about 600 million uh, litres. But gradually you would see that the milk production increases and reaches a peak somewhere between September, October, November, which coincides with the spring season. Um, that has its own implication because of the seasonality of milk production. I'll go through that when we look at some of the challenges. But when you look at the state production, 65% uh, of the total milk production comes from Victoria. And we are very small. We just account for about six, actually that has risen now to about 7% of the total milk production. But extremely relevant, and I'll tell you why Tasmanian dairy industry is very relevant. The table I have here is a bit crowded, and that comes in from the 2012 um, key dairy regional data. And what you would see, uh, charity begins at home, so I'll focus more on Tasmania, but you can make comparisons across the different regions. What you see is that we had an increase as far as the total milk production from 722 million to about 792. And if you look at the total herd size, at the moment, Tasmania has the largest herd size of dairy cattle in the country, even though we have fewer farms, but these few farms have larger number of dairy cattle than any other part of the country, and that's significant. But where I want to dwell on a bit more is that in the whole of the country, Tasmanian dairy farmers are the most positive. According to the National Dairy Survey that was recently released, where 91% of the farmers felt, yes, there's a future for them in the dairy industry, and within the next three years, they plan to increase their investment, and that rose from 40 to 51%. Again, it's actually the most positive in the country. Now, you compare that to dairy farmers in Queensland, who are the most negative where you find that there was a sharp drop to just about 30% saying, yeah, they're positive and would want to increase their productivity. Let's look at some of the key regional data that are driving productivity as far as the farm gate value is concerned. 
Now, what you would see is that even though the farm gate prices that people get, the dairy farmers get, ranges from between 40 to 42 cents per litre, the most advantageous guys are the ones in Queensland, surprisingly, even though they are the most negative. But if you look at the figures right up there, they are being paid about 45 to 53 cents per litre, which is about the highest. And that is because they are locked into a contract that will see them right through to 2014 compared to other parts of the country. Now, what I want to use this to show you is that there are a lot of dynamics that go into the production of milk. So it's not just the cows producing milk, pricing, the dairy retail market, and all those come into play. Um, and that brings me to the dairy supply chain. Uh, I'm not an expert in this, but what I do know is that for the cows to give you milk, there are instances where the inputs have to come in. And here you're talking about water, you're talking of the supplements that you need to give them, and other inputs. And that then moves to the manufacturing sector. So you might as well say that it's a bit of a jigsaw puzzle that all have to fit into place with each component contributing to keep the industry really sustainable and to keep it going into the nearest future. Um, this would probably be the last big data I'll show you, all coming from Dairy Australia as of 2012. The key thing I want to point out is that with water supply, if you look at areas around the Murray, uh, Darling region area, the water is actually a key thing that's driving the productivity of uh, dairy cows. And not only that, irrigators need to know that they have adequate amounts of water that can sustain the business going. And that all leads into the milk production. The other component I want to talk about briefly is the export market. At the moment, the dairy industry is really likely that there is a very strong growing demand still coming from China and Russia. And that is keeping that demand really going uh, and keeping the whole system uh, sort of going on. When we talk about the key drivers, we will see some of the, the major issues there. Don't mind all the, the wordiness of this slide. The only thing I want to draw your attention to is the colors of the, or, of the arrows that I have. Where you have a green arrow, it shows that it is actually positive. Where you see the red, that means danger to the industry. But globally, there are about seven things. The global economy, the global demand, the Australian market, the global supply, the inputs, and then the exchange rates. At the moment, there is a very positive outlook. The only danger is the high exchange rate of the Australian dollar, where at the moment is still hovering above the $100 mark. Now, when that happens, it affects farmers, uh, just like it would affect any other export-driven commodity. But generally, the orange arrows are showing that there's some stability in the global economy and the Australian market. But as far as demand, supply, and inputs are concerned, uh, we're doing OK. OK, some of the prices that are being paid uh, at the moment. Now, one thing you would notice is the continuous zigzag. Uh, and that tells you the volatility in the market price that's currently being paid and the changes in the consumer demand that also affects whether you are producing yogurt or butter or skimmed milk powder and so on. Some years back, the interest was more in uh, cheese. Last year, if you look at the 2011 data, it was more the butter that was attracting the most price. And at the moment, it sort of flattened a bit. That is one of the major challenges, as I will come back to this, that as a dairy farmer, as a dairy person participating in the industry, there are always those volatility within the market and makes it very hard for people to plan and look ahead. Okay, there are seven challenges that are facing the dairy industry that I want to quickly go through. And the first one I've touched on that is the seasonality of milk production. And what I've done is to look at the production of milk across most of the major milk producing states in Australia. And what you would notice is that seasonal peak where at about there, September, October, November side, you have a bit of a, a peak. And almost everywhere, the only two states where you see that the productivity 
uh, over the average. The blue is the average productivity in the past years, and this is like uh, last year's production. It was only in Western Australia and in Tasmania that productivity went over the average. But again, you still have that problem of seasonal milk production. So you have a lot of milk coming this way, and then around here and there, it's very little. And that is a major challenge that the dairy industry has to uh, face. The feed base. This is perhaps one of the most important because 70% of the cost of production is actually due to nutrition. And the feed base is basically one of those things that uh, is a major area of concern. For Tasmania, because we produce pastures, uh, it's much cheaper to produce pasture than grains. And I've put there some of the Victorian grain prices because a lot of the grains we import from, um, from Victoria rather than being produced here. And you would also see volatility in the price. At one point in 2008, it actually almost hit $500 per ton uh, as far as wheat and uh, barley are concerned. But it's sort of come down now uh, as at March this year, it's hovering at about $200 uh, per ton, which is really good. But the challenge is to maintain a low feed base, but more importantly, that that pasture that we're supplying is actually efficient, that the cows are converting it more efficiently. Production of persistent pastures is also one of those challenges. We want pastures that are able to um, you know, stand for a long period of time and also produce for a long period of time. The third is technology. Uh, once upon a time, it was just about the tractors and the way these guys put it, the cow helping the, uh, the farmer to sort of hold the tractor in. But we've sort of moved away from that now to a situation where you have the automated uh, milking machine. Now, this is a one unit where the cow comes in, gets its udders uh, cleaned, and it's milked, the milk recorded automatically, doors open and cows goes in out. Uh, last year I took students to one of these farms where they are operating these in Tasmania. The cows actually get to have a massage because there's a massage thing. After milking, they just go there and rub their backs and, and, and feel really cool. But this unit, there has been a bit of a move from here now to the automated rotary machine where not just one unit but you can actually have hundreds of cows come in, all automatically controlled and milked. Now, as at last year, when I was talking to the farmer that had one of these, he said that unit alone cost a million dollars. At the moment, there's a farm in Delorain that now has the automated milking rotary. They protect it with all that they can. Visitors are not allowed, so we have absolutely no clue how much it costs. So all I'm trying to say is that there's the need for technology, and that technology has to be on a holistic system where the whole farm is actually being looked after. So other issues like milking and processing, we still don't know much about that. The food safety that comes in from these automated machines, nothing is really known as much about that. And then how sustainable uh, is this going to be? If every farmer is going to have that, what that means is that many people would be jobless anyway. You wouldn't need milkers, and you wouldn't need uh, so many things. But it is a challenge to the industry. And I come to an area where I am not by any means an expert at all, and that is greenhouse gas emission and climate change. It is a real problem because cows normally would consume fodder, they would consume pastures and legumes, and you would have a lot of gas accumulating in them, and they have to let that gas out. That's the way nature has created them. For them to survive and for them to produce, they have to let that go. Unfortunately, that adds up to the heat in the system. With all the issues of climate change, it is a reality that dairy farmers have to deal with. Now, I'm not sure how best that will be done, all I know is that from a genetics point of view, there's some research going at the moment that's looking at increasing feed efficiency by selecting cows that are actually more efficient in digesting and converting these feeds and therefore less emissions into the system. There are people who are looking at it from a microbiological point of view to say, well, what if we tamper 
with the environment, the rumen environment, so that we're producing less. Um, so there's quite uh, a lot of uh, areas in there. But the point I want to make is it has to be a whole farm systems approach. Because if you just attend to the cows and then leave all the other aspects, then you might be solving one problem but creating another. Let's move on to the fifth challenge, and that is people. What this farmer wants is to be able to pass on the management of that farm to his little daughter when she grows up. And you can as well say the same thing with this guy with his son. But how many children of farmers really want to go back to the farm? I think those of us that are here in the School of Ag Science, laden with the responsibility of training them and teaching them, and making sure that they go back to the farm, try and ask in your class, how many people want to go back to the farm? I guess you would come out with a figure that's really staggering. The truth is, the average age of the farmer is increasing, so the farmers aren't getting any younger, but very few of their kids want to take over. So you have that intergenerational gap, and that would be a problem as the population continues to age. So it is our responsibility not only to provide that educational training for people that would go back on the farm, but there are real issues with labor. At the moment, it's very hard to find milkers and even harder to maintain those milkers on the farm because it's, it's, it's hard work. Seven days a week, the cows don't know when there's a foodie march and you need to be off, or there are other issues. It's 24 seven, you have to be there to milk and also to give them some chance at uh, putting in their best. Now last year, we had a, an owner student who looked at the possibility of skipping milking once a week and then you know, farmers can go and attend to some other things. And what we found was that it affected the milk yield. It also affected the welfare of the animal, even though we didn't get to measure the amount of cortisol within the cow to tell us the stress levels. But it was quite clear that just keeping one day a week actually has an impact on milk production and the welfare of the cow. So labor and maintaining that labor is a big thing uh, on the farm. Now, I've touched on market volatility. Sometimes it's so frustrating, you feel like biting your laptop. You wish the market would remain stable. But everywhere you go, the prices keep changing, depending on other forces in the market. Uh, I've put there the European Union milk prices, where you find, it doesn't matter whether you're looking at it in the EU, uh, you find that there are those fluctuations that farmers have to deal with. The last problem or the last challenge has to do with the high growth or the high demand in growth. Now, what these um, figures here show is that there is such a huge demand coming in from India, about 47 million metric tons, China and the rest of Asia, that traditional milk producers in the world like New Zealand and, uh, and, and Australia wouldn't be able to cope with. So there's going to be a real big issue of trying to meet this demand. And if we look at the GDP, uh, where that is coming from, what you would see is that within the next couple of years, right up to 2030, it's predicted that India, the rest of Asia and Africa will actually be contributing a lot to the population explosion. And similarly, within that time range, again, what you would see is that the real GDP will increase in places like China, India, Russia, and other parts of the world. And what that means is that there would be approximately about 800 million consumers, and most of them will be in the middle class area. That means they have higher purchasing power, they can be able to afford milk, they can be able to afford other things. So with that sort of a gap, you would find that there's a tremendous increase in the animal protein requirement, and that includes dairy as well. So if you look at the animal protein requirement, what you see is that there would be a steep increase, getting up to the point where other countries like the USA, Australia, and Iceland are at the moment. And that, again, will be reflected in most of the fastest growing uh, emerging markets. So where is the window of opportunity for countries like Australia? And on this graph, what I have tried to do is to say that the traditional milk suppliers, which would be mostly the EU, 
Australia and others, their supply will remain probably steady because we cannot expand okay, at the moment. But you would see that areas like Brazil, Ukraine, Belarus, within the next 10 years, they are actually going to be coming very strongly into the market. So that gives us a window of opportunity between here and right here to 2020 when they would actually take over a lot of the production here for us to do something. And what can Australia do? What can the rest of the milk producing countries do? Um, and that brings me on to the strategic and realistic research directions. What should we be thinking about? How should we go about doing that? Now these are just thoughts. I feel that first and foremost, we have to align ourselves to what the industry is really talking about. What are the industry goals? How can we as a university and research institute sort of align ourselves? Now, there are three things that we are charged with. Educating leaders, leading research, and also providing service. Whereas the industry is looking at productive collaboration so that we can maintain a competitive Australian dairy industry that's able to relate with stakeholders. Now, I went to the Dairy Australia website, and part of their strategic plan is that this year, they intend to spend about 45% of all their money trying to enhance the adaptive capability of the dairy supply chain so that they can improve the growth margins and also the growth opportunities. And they want to be spending about 25 promoting the dairy value, another 5% on coordinating supply chain and climate change and NRM, and about 8% <coughs> supporting the activities of DA. So I feel that us an institute, and as a university, saddled with that responsibility, we need to align ourselves to what the industry wants and how can we deliver, so that the research we're doing is not only applicable, it is relevant, and it can also be adopted by the farmers. Now, I compared what we have between New Zealand, Australia, the EU, and the US, because like I said at the beginning, the dairy industry does not live in isolation. It's in a competitive atmosphere out there, and you've got to know who your competitors are, what sort of advantages do you have over them. So I've looked at cost, the quality of the product we produce, the commercial capability, the product portfolio, and also the supply growth, and made some comparisons. Now, if you see a red in there, it means that that country is highly disadvantaged. A green says we're highly advantaged, and then the yellow is just neutral or slightly disadvantaged. Now, if you look at Australia there, as far as cost is concerned, we have a bit of an advantage and a neutral <coughs> slight disadvantage. You compare that to New Zealand, there's a bit of a problem with cost. And the reason is, land is extremely expensive at the moment in New Zealand. So a lot of the dairy farmers are sort of shifting to Australia and other places where land is cheap so that they can buy and produce grass cheaply and remain profitable in the industry. So we seem to have a bit of an advantage there, actually much more than the EU or the US. And if you look at Australia around the quality, commercial capability and so on, we're all okay. Now this is where the real danger lies in terms of supply. How do we grow the supply of what we produce? And that's where the real disadvantage lies in. And that's where the U.S. has a better advantage because they have that capability to uh, expand. And here on this side, uh, you would see that the cost of production in New Zealand is by far the highest. And I've mentioned it's because of land. Land is pretty expensive <coughs> compared to other places. I think we should be focusing a lot on the feed base, and that's what the Dairy Research Foundation is sort of uh, doing, and we at the Dairy Center have that sort of an alignment to look at the feed base, because if we want to expand our supply, we have to expand the feed base. And there's been three areas of research in the area of modeling, in the field, and also on-farm activities. Now, you need the modeling to be able to see if you can make some predictions. And that has focused more on forages and, and also how you can use um, you know, complementary <coughs> forage systems 
complementary forage rotations to be able to uh, make the dairy system more viable. We also think that we should be thinking about the automated milking system because of labor issues. There's so much at the moment that we don't know as far as the quality and safety of what is being produced, training the cows to get used to robots, automatic heat detection, so many unknowns at the moment that we feel there should be some refinement going on at the farm system level, in the field, within discussion groups, and also on on-farm testing of precision tools. Uh, those are areas that we feel that there should be some work uh, ongoing. So if I am to summarize the five different areas, I think the feed base, animal performance, farming systems, sustainable natural resource, and then people would be the key areas. And within those areas, we think that within the nutrition and health area, in terms of genomics and reproduction, and most importantly, food safety, it's important that what we're producing is actually safe for people to, to consume. Um, and that way, the bridge between the industry and the universities and research institutes can actually be garnered together. I thought I would uh, sort of take you through one more slide where to show you what we're doing at the moment at the Dairy Research Center with the different people. In terms of reproduction and nutrition and lactation modeling, we, in conjunction with other PhD students here, uh, are looking at different ways. We've sort of looked at uh, modeling where uh, one of the PhD students, now that paper just, uh, just published this year, actually not yet out in press, so it's, it's just, uh, um, uh, just coming out in general of dairy science, where we compared 14 different lactation models to be able to help farmers under pasture-based systems to take decisions that would not only help the cows, but also help predict you know, management tools. Um, and at the moment, too, we're planning a, a study where we're looking at omega-3 oils as supplements for dairy cows to see what impact that has on uh, reproductive performance. And we're hoping that by the 18th of October, the PhD student will start that work uh, at Bernie. And there are some other areas too within the feed base, the pastures and soil nutrient management where Richard Ronsley, Keith and Bill Coaching are leading that arm. And at the moment too with climate change, there are people like Richard Ronsley and Keith also looking at those areas and the impact on the dairy industry. And Dairy Smart is an extension project that's uh, gradually coming to an end at the moment but it involves a lot of extension and linkages directly with the Tasmanian dairy industry. So I feel that if we can strengthen those relationships between TIA, the university, and the Tasmanian government to deliver to the dairy industry as far as quality service, research, extension, uh, and capacity building, then we would actually be achieving uh, that mandate. But for that to all happen, uh, there has to be multidisciplinary research relationships where the geneticists, the nutritionists, the pasture people are all talking to each other and working together as a group. And that means that we have a team culture of collaboration uh, where there are linkages. And within these linkages that we are really paying attention to details, and when I say paying attention, I don't mean, you know, looking for attention like this guy who <laughs> would uh, want to draw attention to himself or this one who wants to be a star and draw attention to herself. If that happens where one arm of the research linkage is sort of acting and the others aren't, then you're likely to find that the whole thing is derailing more like a train wreckage. So some part is on the bridge, the others are completely gone, and that's not what you want. I believe that research leadership is all about service. And when you want to provide that service, it's important that that research leadership respects every arm of that group in the team, and they have that attitude where the leaders are actually servants. They can come down to the level of everyone so that you are carrying everyone uh, together. I also believe that it's all about being able to listen. 
it means that others can actually bring forth their ideas and no idea is stupid. Now within that sort of a multi-collaborative team, we should be able to accommodate all sorts of ideas coming in. You never know what you think might be a stupid idea could turn out to be you know, something that's uh, really worth doing. And so it's important that the leadership is actually willing to listen. I also believe that there's the need within that research partnership that we appreciate people, no matter how little they are contributing. Sometimes it just takes these two words, thank you, and you get the best out of people because it inspires them, it motivates them. Uh, such a word could actually make a cow want to fly or a cow thinks, yeah, now I'm appreciated and, and, and I can fly. Just saying good job actually helps. I want to draw the presentation to a close by saying that in research, we need to be creative. And being creative means thinking outside the box. It means that you have to come up with ideas that are innovative, ideas that are totally out of this world sometimes, but applicable. And I want to use the work of Carl Warner. Carl Warner uh, lives in Kent in the UK. Uh, he's a landscape artist. And what he decided doing was something totally out of this world where his kids didn't like veggies, his kids didn't like fruits, and so he went ahead and started buying all these fruits and making really beautiful designs, uh, what he calls food landscaping. For instance, you look at that there and you think, Ooh, <coughs> the balloons are actually made of fruits and legumes, and you find that the tree there is actually broccoli and rocks that are actually potatoes. You look at the field of corns and peppers, and you look at the town, it's actually made of cheese with a carrot tower. Very creative. How about this? Where you have a rural scene set up in Italy, but in reality it's actually a lasagna cut, and you've got all sorts of pasta all built in together to look uh, pretty creative. You look at the clouds, they look like clouds, but they are actually uh, food. And this is actually bread that he sort of made that looks like rocks and the mountains. These are all just creative designs that other artists don't, don't sort of do, but he sort of went out to do that. And this with broccoli and, and the rock, I don't know how he made that waterfalls to, you know, sort of start splashing down. And this underwater scene is actually made out of... Uh, you know, the rocks are out of bread, and you find cauliflower as well, uh, just to give it a bit of a dimension. And these are from sweet potato. The sky there is actually made out of uh, um, cabbage, uh, all to give it uh, a bit of a dimension. And this is sunset using salmon fillets, which uh, give you that sense of, uh, that's the, the, the sea. Um, and then this bowl with the rainbow is actually a plate, and behind you find potatoes and, and other things that give it uh, the look of a forest. And finally, the thinking man, which uh, is made out of all sorts of uh, fruits that you can imagine. Uh, the bottom line is we need to be creative, and in that creativity, thinking of how best we can uh, deliver. So in summary, what I've just said is that the global outlook for the dairy industry is positive. There would be more demand, uh, more suppliers. And let's not forget that the dairy industry operates in a very competitive world. And for them to maintain that advantage, they have to remain really relevant and competitive. So we need cutting edge technology and strategic research leadership where there should be multidisciplinary linkages and let's not forget, too, that we have a mandate to provide educational training to the young ones and quality service to the industry.